sphere of the Bodhisattvas. Today, on the occasion of our general meeting, I feel it incumbent upon me to speak on a sublime subject that concerns man. You must allow me to begin by mentioning once again that it is necessary for us to grow accustomed to speak on these subjects in such a way that we must not rest satisfied with a one-sided rendering of the particulars connected with the higher world regarding the general idea of the bodhisattvas and their mission. We must accustom ourselves to penetrate from the abstract to the concrete and try with the help of the ideas and sentiments that we have acquired from our sincere and loving study of life to press through even to the sublime subjects pertaining to the bodhisattvas. In doing this, we must not merely accept the facts communicated to us, but try to a certain extent to understand them. For this reason, I intend in this lecture to begin by giving some description of the concept men had of the bodhisattvas and of how that concept moved through the world. We cannot really understand what a bodhisattva is without going somewhat deeply into the progressive course of man's evolution and calling to mind some of the things we have heard in the last few years. Let us consider the nature of this progress. After the great Atlantean catastrophe, humanity went through the period of the ancient Indian civilization, during which the great rishis were the teachers of man. Then followed the period of the ancient Persians, Persian civilization, then that of the Egypto-Chaldean civilization, then the Greco-Latin period up to our own, which is the fifth period of civilization of the post-Atlantean age. The purpose of these periods is the progressive development of humanity from one form of life to another. Progress is not made only in what is generally described in external history. If we take great periods of time, we find that all the sentiments and feelings, all the concepts and ideas of men are altered and renewed in the course of the development of humanity. What would be the use of advocating the idea of re-embodiment or reincarnation if we did not know this? What use would it be for our souls to come back over and over again into earthly bodies unless they were to learn something new each time, not only to have new experiences, but to learn to feel differently? Even the capacities of man, the intimacies of his soul life, are each time renewed and altered. This makes it possible for the soul to do more than merely ascend stage by stage as though up a series of steps, because each time it meets with opportunities of acquiring something new on earth through the altered conditions of life. The soul is not merely guided from one incarnation to another by its sins and errors, but as our earth alters in every one of its conditions of life, so our souls can each time add something new from without. Therefore the soul progresses, not only from incarnation to incarnation, but also from one period of civilization to another. The soul would not, however, be able to progress and develop were it not that these beings who had already reached a high development and were in some way or another above ordinary humanity had taken care that something new might always flow into earthly civilization. In other words, we could not have advanced if there had not been great teachers at work who, on account of their higher development, were able to receive the experiences from the higher worlds and carry them down to the scene of action of the life of earthly culture. There have always been such beings in the development of our earth. I am only speaking here of the post-Atlantean development, and these beings were in certain respects the teachers of the rest. We can only understand the nature of these teachers of humanity if we are if we are clear as to the way humanity itself progresses. You will have heard the two lectures just given by Dr. G Carl Unger on the ego in its relation to the non-ego, in its comprehension of itself, considered according to the theory of knowledge. Now do you suppose that what you have heard rendered by human lips and human thinking today could have been heard in this same form 2,500 years ago? It would have been impossible any place on earth to speak of the ego in this form of pure thought. Suppose some individuality 2,500 years ago had desired to incarnate into our earthly life, having made up his mind beforehand to speak of the ego in that special way. 
Well, it could not have been done. Anyone who supposes that anything of the kind could have been uttered by human lips 2,500 years ago fails entirely to recognize the actual progress and change in the development of civilization since that time. For this to be possible, it would not only be necessary for an individuality to resolve to incarnate in a human body, but it would also be necessary for the earth to be able in its evolution to produce a human body with a particular sort of brain in which it would be possible for the truths, which are of a quite different nature in the higher worlds, to take the form we call pure thought, that is, the way in which Dr. Unger spoke of the ego. 2,500 years ago there would have been, been no human brain capable of being an instrument for translating these truths into such thoughts. The beings who wish to descend to our earth must make use of the bodies that this earth produces. Our earth, however, throughout the different periods of civilization, has also brought forth bodies with ever different organizations. Humanity, having produced the necessary bodies, it is only in our fifth post-Atlantean epoch of civilization that it has become possible to speak in the form of pure thought. Even in the Greco-Latin age it would not have been possible to speak in terms of a theory of knowledge, because no instrument existed to form such thoughts in human language. That precisely is the task of our fourth, up fifth post-Atlantean period. In it, the physical organization of man must gradually be formed into an instrument through which those truths, which in other ages were grasped in quite other forms, can flow in ever purer thought. We will take another example. When we consider the question of good and evil today, hesitating as to whether or not we should do a certain thing, we say that a kind of inner voice speaks, telling us that we ought not to do this, but we ought to do that. We feel that this has nothing to do with any outer law. If we listen to this inner voice, we perceive a certain impulse in it, an incitement to act in a certain way. We call this inner voice conscience. Should a man hold the opinion that the different periods of human development were all exactly alike, he might easily believe that conscience has existed as long as humans have inhabited the earth. That would not be correct. We can, so to speak, prove historically that men first began to speak of conscience at a particular time. It is clearly evident that this occurred between the time of Aeschylus, who was born in the 6th century BC, and Euripides, who was born in the 5th. You will find no mention of conscience previous to this. Even in Aeschylus you will not find what could be called the inner voice. When he wrote of such things, they still took the form of astral, pictorial apparitions, the Furies, or Arignes, or I don't know how to say that word, Arignes, vengeful beings appear to men. The time finally came, however, when the astral perception of the Furies was replaced by the inner voice of conscience. <clears throat> Even in the Greco-Latin period, in which a dim astral perception was still present, a man who had committed a wrong could perceive that every wrong act created astral forms in his environment whose presence filled him with anxiety and fear for what he had done. Such forms were man's educators at that time. They gave him his impulses. When he finally lost the last remnant of his astral clairvoyance, this perception was, re was replaced by the invisible voice of conscience, which is to say, what was at first outside then entered the soul and became one of the forces within it. The alteration that has taken place in mankind in the course of its development stems from the fact that the external instrument of man in which he seeks embodiment has changed. Five thousand years ago, when a human soul did something wrong, the furies were perceived. The soul could not then have heard the voice of conscience. In this way it learned to establish an inner relation to good and evil. This same soul was born again and again, and at last it was born into a body possessing an organization in which the capacity of conscience could arise. In a future cycle of human development, other forms and other capacities will be experienced in the soul. I have repeatedly stressed the fact that no one who really understands anthroposophy will dogmatically assert that the form in which it is expressed today will be permanent and that it will remain as it is for the humanity of all future time, 
such is not the case. In 2500 years the same truths will not be revealed in this form, but will have a form in keeping with the instruments of that future time. If you bear this in mind, it will be clear to you that humanity must be spoken to in a different manner in each successive age, and that the attitude of the great teachers toward the capacities and qualities of man must likewise differ. This signifies that the great teachers themselves develop and change from one cycle or age to another. In the ages through which humanity has progressed, we find a progressive evolution of the great teachers of humanity going on above man. Man passes through certain stages and then reaches a certain turning point, and so it is with the great teachers. <clears throat> we are now living in the fifth period of our post-Atlantean epoch of civilization. This is in a certain sense a recapitulation of the third, the Egypto-Chaldean period. The sixth will in like manner recapitulate the ancient Persian and the seventh will recapitulate the ancient Indian. Thus do the various cycles overlay each other. The fourth period will not be recapitulated. It stands in the middle, sufficient unto itself, as we might say. What does this mean? It means that what men experienced in the Greco-Latin period they need go through only once, not that they were only once incarnated in it, but that they only experienced that period in one form. What was experienced in the Egypto-Chaldean period is being recapitulated now. It will thus be experienced in a twofold form. There are certain stages of development that show a sort of crisis, while other periods are alike in certain respects, the one recapitulating the other, but in a different form. Man's development in the post-Atlantean age was such that he went through a certain number of incarnations in the ancient Indian period, and those he goes through in the seventh period will resemble them. A similar resemblance will be found to occur between the se second and sixth, and between the third and fifth periods. In the fourth period, which lies between these, there were a number of incarnations that resemble no other, and that therefore mark a transition. Man goes through a descending and an ascending development. The great teachers of humanity also go through a period of descent and then one of ascent and differ absolutely in the different periods. Now as man in the first post-Atlantean period had quite different capacities from those he acquired later, he had to be instructed in a quite different way. To what do we owe the fact that in our time wisdom can be clothed in the concise forms of pure thought? We owe this to the circumstance that in our period of development the chief and average quality that is being developed is the consciousness soul. In the Greco-Latin period the intellectual soul was developed, in the Egypto-Chaldean the sentient soul, in the ancient Persian the sentient body, and in the ancient Indian the etheric body. <clears throat> All as the chief factors in their respective cultures, of course. What the consciousness soul is to us the etheric body was to the inhabitants of ancient India. Therefore they had quite a different way of grasping and understanding. If you had spoken to an ancient Indian in forms of pure thought, he would not have had the faintest idea of what you meant. To him such words would have been mere sounds without meaning. The great teachers could not have taught the ancient Indians by communicating wisdom to them in the form of pure thought, nor could they have explained it with words. To the ancient Indians the great teachers said little, because at the stage that the etheric body had then reached, people were not receptive to the word that enclosed thought. It is difficult for people of our day to imagine how teaching could have occurred under such conditions. Little, indeed, was spoken. Rather did the listening soul recognize in the nuances of the sound, in the way a word was uttered, what flowed down from the spiritual world. But the main thing was that the word was only a call to attention, so to speak, the signal for a relationship to be established between the teacher and the hearer. <clears throat> In the earliest times of the ancient Indian period, the word was hardly more than the ringing of a bell is today, when we wish to signal that something is to begin. It was a crystallizing point around which were woven undefinable spiritual currents that passed from the teacher to the pupil. Of greatest importance was what the teacher was in his inmost personality. It did not matter what he said, 
The qualities of his soul were of the greatest importance, because a sort of inspiration passed from him to the pupil. The pupil had chiefly developed his etheric body, and the teacher had to address himself especially to that. It was much easier to understand what the teacher himself was than anything spoken by him. Before they could understand the spoken word, men had to pass through the subsequent periods of civilization. It was not necessary, therefore, for any one of the great teachers of the ancient Indians to have a particularly well-developed intellectual or consciousness soul. At that time it would have been an instrument of which he could make no use. One thing was necessary in these great teachers, however. Their etheric bodies had to be at a more advanced stage of development than were those of the people. If a great teacher had stood at the same stage of development as they, he could not have had much effect on them. He could not have communicated messages from a higher world, nor given impulses for progress. In a certain sense, what man was to grow to be in the future had first to be brought to him. The Indian teacher had to anticipate, as it were, what the others would only be able to acquire in the subsequent ancient Persian period of civilization. What the ordinary man in the ancient Persian period would acquire through the sentient body, the great teacher of the Indians had to communicate through the etheric body. Thus the etheric body of such a teacher could not work like the etheric bodies of other men, but rather as the sentient body was to work in the Persian civilization. If a seer, in the present sense of the word, had come in contact with one of the great Indian teachers, he would have asked what sort of etheric body he had, for such an etheric body would have looked like an astral body of the ancient Persian period. It was, however, no simple matter for such an etheric body to have worked as an astral body of a later period. It could not have been brought about at that time by an advanced stage of development, but could only have been made possible by the descent of a being who had already reached a more highly developed stage than the others, one who had incarnated in a human body that was really neither suited to nor well adapted to him, but that he was obliged to enter to make himself understood by others. Outwardly he would have looked like other men, but inwardly quite different. To judge such an individual by his outer aspect would be to deceive oneself utterly, for while the outer appearance of ordinary persons harmonizes with their inner beings, in the case of these teachers their inner and outer beings were in complete contradiction. Here we have an individuality who, as far as he himself was concerned, had no longer any need to come down to earth at all, but who descended to a certain stage and took his place among the ancient Indian people to teach them. He descended willingly and incarnated in human form, though he was a different being altogether. He was an individuality who was not affected by the destiny to which a normal man, as man, is subject. A teacher of this kind lived in a body having an external destiny, yet he took no part in that destiny. He lived in his body as in a house. <laughs> when his body died, death for him was a different experience from what it is for other men. Birth, too, and the experiences between birth and death were quite different for him. Hence such a being worked in quite a different way in this human instrument. <clears throat> Let us picture to ourselves in what way such an individuality used his brain, for instance. Even if he was able to perceive through the astral body, yet the brain, which indeed was organized differently, had to be used as an instrument to observe the pictures through which perceptions were received. There were therefore two human types. The one used his brain as an ordinary human being, the teacher type did not use his brain at all in the ordinary way, but in a certain sense left it unused. A great teacher did not need to use his brain in all its details. He knew things that other people could only learn through the instrument of the brain. Such was not a real incarnation of a human being in the ordinary sense. It represented a sort of double nature. A spiritual being lived in this organization. There were such beings also in the later Persian and the Egyptian periods. In their individuality they towered far above their human organizations and were not wholly contained within them. For this reason they were able to work on the rest of the people. This state continued to the time when in the Greco-Latin period 
an important crisis occurred in the development of mankind. Now, in the Greco-Latin age, the intellectual soul gradually began to form inner faculties. Whereas in the preceding time the chief things flowed in from outside, as we saw in the example of the Furies, when men had avenging beings around but not in them, in the Greco-Latin period something began to flow from within toward the great teachers. In this way quite new conditions were established. Formerly, beings from the higher worlds descended and found a state of things that enabled them to say, It is not necessary for us completely to enter the human organization because we can do our work by carrying down to men and causing to flow into them what they cannot otherwise obtain from the higher worlds. At that time it was not yet necessary for man to contribute anything. There was no need for him to bring anything to meet the great teachers. But if the great teachers had continued this policy, it might have occurred from the fourth period onward that one of these great individualities would have descended to some part of the earth and found there something that did not exist above. As long as the Furies, the avenging spirits, were visible, men could turn their attention away from what was to be found on earth. Now, however, came conscience, something quite new that was unknown to the spirits above. There was no possibility of observing it up there, and it came as something quite new to them. In other words, in the fourth period of post-Atlantean civilization, the necessity arose for these great teachers actually to descend to the stage of man, therein to learn what it was that was rising to meet them from human souls. <clears throat> the time now began when it would no longer do for them not to share to some extent in the qualities inherent in man. Let us now consider that significant being whom in his earthly incarnation we know as Gautama Buddha. He was a being who had always been able to incarnate in the earthly bodies of the various periods of civilization without having had to use everything in this human organization. It had not been necessary for this being to go through real human incarnations. Now, however, came an important turning point for this Bodhisattva. It became necessary for him within earthly body that he was to enter, to become acquainted with all the destinies of the human organization. He was to experience something that could only be experienced in an earthly body. And because he was such a high individuality, this one incarnation would suffice for him to see all that a human body can develop. Other people must evolve their inner capacities gradually throughout the fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh periods. But Buddha was to experience all that it was possible to evolve in this one incarnation. In his incarnation as Gautama Buddha, he, wa he saw in advance the first germ of what was to arise in man as conscience, which will become ever greater as time goes on. He was therefore able to reascend into the spiritual world directly after that incarnation. There was no need for him to go through another. What man will, in a certain sphere, evolve out of himself during future cycles, Buddha was able to come to give as a great directing force in this one incarnation. This came about through the event that has been described as sitting under the Bodhi tree. Then, in accordance with his special mission, he gave forth the teaching of compassion and love contained in the Eightfold Path. This great ethic of humanity, which men will acquire as their own during the civilizations yet to come, was laid down as a basic force in the mind of the Buddha, who descended at that time. From Bodhisattva he became Buddha, which means that he learned from his descent and really rose a stage higher. That, in different words, describes the great event in Eastern civilization known as the Bodhisattva becoming Buddha. When this Bodhisattva, who had never really incarnated, became twenty-nine years old, his individuality, which had never completely had possession of him, fully entered the son of Sudhadana. He then experienced the great human teaching of compassion and love. Why did this Bodhisattva, who then became Buddha, incarnate in this people? Why not in the Greco-Latin people? If this Bodhisattva was really to become the Buddha of the fourth post-Atlantean period of civilization, 
He had to bring in something new for the future. When the consciousness soul has been fully developed, man will by its means gradually become sufficiently ripe to recognize the great impetus given by Buddha. At a time when man had only developed the intellectual soul, it was necessary that Buddha should already have developed the consciousness soul. He had so to use the physical instrument of the brain that he was to become complete master of it, and this in quite a different fashion than could have been done by one who might have progressed as far as the Greco-Latin period of civilization. <clears throat> the Greco-Latin brain would have been too hard for him to, see, to use. It would only have enabled him to develop the intellectual soul, whereas he had to develop the consciousness soul. For that he required a brain that had remained softer. He made use of the soul that was only to develop later in an instrument that had been used by man in earlier times and had been retained by the Indian people. Here again we have a recapitulation. Buddha repeated a human organization belonging to earlier times together with a soul capacity belonging to times yet to come. The events that took place in the evolution of humanity are to this extent of the nature of a necessity. Between the 5th and 6th centuries BC, Buddha had the task of introducing the consciousness soul into the organization of man. He, as a single individual, could not, however, take over the whole task of doing all that was necessary in order that the consciousness soul might develop in the right way from the fifth epoch onward. <clears throat> His own particular mission comprised only one part of that task, that of bringing to man the doctrine of compassion and love. Other teachers of humanity had other tasks. This part of the ethics of humanity, the ethic of love and compassion, was first introduced by Buddha, and its vibrations still endure. Humanity, however, must develop in future a number of other qualities besides these, for instance that of thinking in forms of pure thought, in crystal clear thoughts. It was no part of Buddha's mission to build up thoughts, to add one clear thought to another. His task was to form and establish what leads man of his own accord to find the Eightfold Path. So another teacher of humanity, having quite different faculties, one who could bring down a different stream of spiritual life from the higher spiritual worlds into this world, was given the task of carrying down what is gradually showing itself in mankind today as the faculty of logical thought. This only developed as time went on. But a teacher had to be found who was able to bring down what makes it possible for man to express himself in forms of pure thought. What Buddha accomplished had to be taken up by the intellectual soul. This soul, through its position between the sentient soul and the consciousness soul, possesses the peculiar attribute of recapitulating nothing. The ancient Indian epoch will be repeated in the seventh, the ancient Persian in the sixth, the Egyptian in our own. The fourth epoch stands alone, however, and so does the intellectual soul. The forces necessary for our intellectual faculties, which appear only in the consciousness soul, could not be developed in the intellectual soul. Although they were only to appear later, they had to be laid down as seeds and stimulated at an earlier period. In other words, the impulse for logical thinking had to be given before the Buddha gave the impulse for conscience. Conscience was to become organized in man in the fourth epoch. Conscious, pure thinking was to develop in the consciousness soul in the fifth epoch. But as the seeds for what we are evolving now, they had to be laid down in the third epoch of civilization. That is why that other great teacher had the task of instilling into the sentient soul the forces that now appear as pure thought. It is therefore easy to see that the difference between this teacher and a normal man was even greater than it was in Buddha. Something had to be aroused in the sentient soul that did not yet exist in any living man. Concepts which were still to be developed would not have helped. So although this individuality had the task of planting the seeds of certain faculties, it would have been impossible for him to make use of them. Thus he had to employ other quite different forces.
I explained this morning that certain forces working on the sentient soul through vision will become conscious forces at a higher stage that will then appear in the form of thought. If that great teacher had been able to stimulate the sentient soul so that the forces of thought could penetrate it in somewhat the same way as thought life subconsciously penetrates it through vision, then without realizing it he might have achieved something. But this could only be done in one way by this teacher, to stimulate the sentient soul and instill in it the power of thought. This individuality had to work in a special way. He had to instruct not in concepts, but through music. Music engenders forces that set free in the sentient soul something that becomes logical thinking when it rises into consciousness and has been worked on by the consciousness soul. Music came forth from this mighty being who used it to teach. You may think this strange. Perhaps you will think it to be impossible. Nevertheless, so it was. Before the Greco-Latin age, there existed in certain parts of Europe an ancient culture among those people who had remained behind with respect to the qualities strongly developed in the East. In those parts of Europe, the people were unable to think readily. Their development differed from that of the East, and they possessed few intellectual soul forces. Their sentient souls, however, were quite receptive to what proceeded from the impulses of a special kind of music, which differed from our music today. We thus go back to a time in Europe when there was what we might call an ancient musical culture, a time when not only the bards were the teachers, as they were later when these things had already fallen into decadence, but when a music full of enchantment passed through all parts of Europe. In the third, the Egyptian epoch of civilization, there was a profound musical culture in Europe, and the minds of those people who were waiting quietly for what they were destined to carry out later were receptive in a particular way to the effects of music. These effects worked upon the sentient soul in a way similar to that in which thought substance works upon it through the eyes. Thus did music work on the physical plane, but the sentient soul felt subconsciously that this music came from the same regions as light, music, the song from the realms of light. Long ago there was a primeval teacher in the civilized parts of Europe who, in this sense, was a primeval bard, the pioneer of all ancient bards and minstrels. He taught in the physical plane through music, and he taught in such a way that something was thereby communicated to the sentient soul that was like the rising and shining of a sun. What tradition retained concerning this great teacher was later collected by the Greeks, who were still influenced by him from the West just as they were influenced in a different way from the East, and this they embodied in their conception of Apollo. Apollo, the sun god and god of music, dates back to that great teacher of primeval times who introduced into the human soul the faculty that today has become the ability to think logically. The Greeks also tell of a pupil of this great teacher of humanity, one who became a pupil in a special way. How could one become the pupil of this being? In those days when this being was to work in the manner just described, he was not, of course, encompassed in a physical organization, but transcended all that walks the earth as physical man. A man with an ordinary sentient soul might have been receptive to musical effects, but he could not have aroused them in others. A higher individuality had descended who was like the radiance of what lived in the outside cosmos. In the fourth post-Atlantean epoch of civilization, in the Greco-Latin period, it became necessary, however, that he should descend again, this time to the human stage, to make use of all the faculties of man. Yet, although he made use of all the human faculties, he could not quite descend completely. In order to bring about what I have described, he needed faculties that transcend those possessed by a human organization of the fourth post-Atlantean period. The effects of this music even then included what was to be found in the consciousness soul, and it could not have lived in an or individuality organized only for the intellectual soul. Hence, while incarnated in such a form, he still had to hold something back. His incarnation in the fourth epoch was such that, although he completely filled the whole human form, he, as man, dwelling within that form, had something within him that extended far beyond it. <clears throat> 
He knew something of a spiritual world, but he could not make use of it because he had a soul that extended beyond his body. Humanly speaking, there was something tragic in the fact that the individuality who had acted as a great teacher in the third epoch of civilization should have had to incarnate again in a body in which his soul was to a great extent outside it, so that he could not make use of this superior and unusual faculty. One who experienced this kind of incarnation was called a son of Apollo, because what had previously lived on earth was reincarnated in a complicated and not direct way. A son of Apollo bore within him as soul what mysticism designates by the symbol of the feminine element. He could not bear all of this soul within him because it was in another world. His feminine soul element was in another world to which he had no access, but he nevertheless longed for it because of the part of himself that was there. This marvelous inner tragedy of the reincarnated teacher of former times has been wonderfully preserved in Greek mythology in Orpheus, the son of Apollo, the name given to the reincarnated Apollo. This tragedy of the soul is presented in a marvelous way in the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. Eurydice was soon torn from Orpheus and lived in another world, but Orpheus still had the power, through his music, of deeply touching the beings of the nether world. Thus he obtained permission from them to take Eurydice back with him, but with the stipulation that he not look back. That would mean inner death, or at any rate would bring about a loss of what he formerly was and could not now take into himself. Thus in this incarnation of Apollo as Orpheus we have again a sort of ascent of a bodhisattva. If we may use this eastern term to Buddhahood, we might note a number of such beings who stand out throughout the ages as the great teachers of humanity. Each of them always underwent a special experience at the time of his deepest descent. The Buddha experiences the bliss of inspiring the whole of humanity. That bodhisattva whose memory is preserved with the name Apollo also had an individual experience. He was to prepare the individuality, the quality of the ego. He experiences the tragedy of the ego. That is the fact that this ego is in the present state of man not entirely within him. Man is struggling up to the higher ego. <clears throat> that was foreshadowed by the, for the Greeks by the Buddha or Bodhisattva in Orpheus. These particulars furnish us with a characterization of the great teachers of humanity that makes it possible for us to form a picture in our minds. If you summarize what I have said, you will find that I have been speaking all along of those beings who formed the sentient and consciousness souls in a particular way as inner faculties, faculties that must draw into man from within. Since we are surveying this one particular period, we can only consider those two beings who formed the sentient soul, the inner nature of man evolving gradually, stage by stage, however, and there are many such beings. Let us now compare yet another being with what affects the inner nature of man. Indeed, we must say to ourselves, if there is a constant succession of teachers who supply the progressing and developing inner faculties of man with spiritual food from the higher regions, then there must also be other individualities who accomplish other work, taking part, above all, in the changes in the earth itself and in what evolves from one age to another. Although the Buddha influence the intellectual soul from within through the consciousness soul in the fourth period of civilization, it must also have been influenced from without. A being had to approach the intellectual soul from without, from another side, to work in a quite different way. A teacher such as those we have been describing had, when he appeared among men, to pour into their inner beings what he had brought down from higher regions. He was a teacher. What did the other being, who was to bring the earth forward so that it developed further from one generation to another, have to do? He was not only to influence the inner being of man, so this or that faculty would develop within him, but he, himself, as being, had to descend to the earth. He who was to descend was not merely to teach the intellectual soul, but to form it. One who was himself to be the direct expression of the intellectual soul in the fourth period, that eminent period that stands alone in the middle of man's evolution, 
had to appear on earth to form that soul. This being had to come from a quite different side. He had to draw into human nature itself to incarnate in it. The bodhisattvas transformed the inner nature of man. This being transformed his whole nature. He made it possible for the teachers to find a suitable soil on which to work in the future. He transformed the whole human being. We must recall how the different souls in man build themselves into the different bodies, the sentient soul into the sentient body, the intellectual into the etheric body, and the consciousness soul into the physical body. The field of action of the bodhisattvas is there where the consciousness soul builds itself into the physical body. That is where they lay hold of man from the one side. Where the intellectual soul works into the etheric body, another being in the fourth period influenced man from another side. When did he do this? It was accomplished at the time when an etheric body of man could be directly affected when that being whom we have described in detail as Jesus of Nazareth forsook the physical body at the moment of the baptism in the Jordan, when that body was wholly immersed, whereby occurred what we have described as a shock, the Christ being sank down into that etheric body. He is the individuality who comes from quite a different side and who is of quite a different nature, whereas in the case of the other great leaders of humanity we have to do with more highly evolved human beings, in a sense, men who have at least once been subject to all the fate of a man. This cannot be said of the Christ. What is the lowest principle of the Christ being? Counting from below it is the etheric body. That means that when man some day through spirit's self shall have transformed his whole astral body and then sets to work on his etheric body, he will then be working in an element in which the Christ once worked in the same way. Christ gives an impulse of the most powerful kind. It will continue to work on into the future, and man will only achieve it when he begins to work at the transmutation of his etheric body in a conscious way. <clears throat> in his journey through life, man starts from birth or even conception and travels on until death. From death to his next birth is another journey. On his way from death to a new birth, he first passes through the astral world, then through what we call the lower part of the devakonic world, and after that through the higher devakonic world. Using Western terms, we call the physical world the little world, or world of mental powers, of intelligence. The astral world is called the elemental world, lower devakon, the heavenly world. The higher world is the world of reason, discernment, or discretion. The Western mind is only gradually evolving to the point where true expressions may be found in its language. Therefore what lies beyond the devakonic world has been given a religious coloring. It is called the world of providence, which is the same as the buddhi plane. What is beyond that could indeed be seen by the old clairvoyant vision, as ancient tradition tells. No name can be formed for it in the European languages. Only in our present day can the seer once more work his way up to the world that is above and beyond the world of providence. European languages cannot truly give a name to this world. It does indeed exist. But thinking is not yet far enough advanced to be able to describe it. One cannot just give any name one pleases to the world that is beyond the world of providence and that oriental knowledge calls nirvana. As I was saying, between death and rebirth man ascends to higher devakon or world of reason, and from there looks into higher worlds, worlds he cannot enter. There he sees the higher beings at work. Whereas man spends his life in worlds extending between the physical plane and devakon, it is normal for the bodhisattvas to reach to the buddhi plane, or what in the West we call the world of providence. That is a good name because it is precisely the task of the bodhisattvas to guide the world as a good providence from age to age. Now what took place after the bodhisattva had gone through the embodiment of Gautama Buddha? When he reached a certain stage, he was able to ascend to the next higher plane, the nirvana plane, that is, his next sphere. It is characteristic of the bodhisattvas that when they become Buddhas they ascend to the plane of nirvana. Everything that works on the inner being of man dwells in a sphere that extends to that plane. 
A being such as the Christ, however, works into man's nature from the other side. He also works from the other side into those worlds to which the bodhisattvas ascend when they leave the region of man in order themselves to learn so that they may become teachers of humanity. There they meet a being such as the Christ coming down to them from above, from the other side. They then become pupils of Christ. A being such as he is surrounded by twelve bodhisattvas. We cannot speak of more than twelve because when the twelve bodhisattvas have accomplished their missions, the period of earth existence shall have been completed. Christ was once on earth. He descended to earth, lived on the earth, and ascended from it. He comes from the other side. He is the being who is in the midst of the twelve bodhisattvas, and they receive from him what they carry down to earth. Thus between two incarnations, the bodhisattva beings ascend to the buddhi plane where they meet the being of Christ as teacher in full consciousness. The meeting between the bodhisattvas and the Christ take pl- takes place on the buddhi plane. When men have progressed further and have developed the qualities instilled into them by the bodhisattvas, they themselves will become more and more worthy to penetrate that sphere. In the meantime, it is necessary that they should learn that the Christ being was incarnated in human form in Jesus of Nazareth, and that in order to reach the true being of the individuality of Christ, they must first permeate this human form with understanding. Thus twelve bodhisattvas belong to Christ. They prepare and further develop what he brought as the greatest impulse in the evolution of human civilization. We see the twelve, and in their midst the thirteenth. We have now ascended to the sphere of the bodhisattvas and entered a circle of twelve stars. In their midst is the sun, illuminating and warming them. From this sun they draw the source of life that afterward they have to carry down to earth. How is the image of what takes place above represented on earth? It is projected to the earth in such a way that we may say that Christ, who once lived on the earth, brought to this earth evolution an impulse for which the bodhisattvas had to prepare humanity. They then had to develop further what he gave to the earth evolution. Thus the picture on earth is one in which the Christ stands in the middle of the earth evolution with the bodhisattvas as his antecessors and predecessors, whose mission it is as messengers to bring his work closer to the minds and hearts of men. A number of bodhisattvas had thus to prepare mankind and make men ripe to receive the Christ. Now, although men were ready to have Christ among them, it will be a long time before they mature sufficiently to recognize, feel, and will all that Christ is. The same number of bodhisattvas will be required to develop to maturity what was poured into men through Christ, as was necessary to prepare men for his coming. Christ is so great that the forces and faculties of men must continue to increase before they will be able to understand him fully. With their existing faculties, they can only understand Christ to a limited extent, but higher faculties will arise in them, and each new faculty will enable them to see him in a new light. Only when the last bodhisattva belonging to Christ shall have completed his work will humanity realize what Christ really is. Men will then be filled with a will in which the Christ himself will live. He will draw into men through their thinking, feeling, and willing, and they will then really be the external expression of Christ on earth.